know you could all watch him fuss with my clothing or we could see him. <laughs> The speakers who've praised Al Plantinga before me have talked about his achievements in writing and in teaching, and those achievements are manifest here today, as so many of the people who were his students, either formally or informally, are gathered together to honor him and to discuss work whose source or seed is some stimulus in his own work. And many people have also called attention to his admirable integration of faith and learning and to his marvelous warmth and generosity as a person as well. So many people have already talked about things that I otherwise would have said myself. But I certainly want to add my voice to the chorus of voices that have praised him. And so I thought what there was left for me to do and all I could think about was to tell you a little bit about my own history with Al. When I was still a comparative stranger to Al, I told him that I thought he ought to mentor me as a service to the church. <laughs> and, and with really wonderful patience, he said, Okay, Eleanor. <laughs> So I set up a year-long series of lunch meetings with him, to which he dutifully and patiently came, the purpose of which, in my view, was for him to teach me how to be like him. <clears throat> when I gave up, <laughs> I said sadly that the whole misguided effort was like a French poodle's trying to learn how to be a St. Bernard. <clears throat> And he said very kindly, well, maybe a terrier, Eleanor. <laughs> <laughs> I have since made my peace with the fact that I'm going to do things my own way. <clears throat> but over the years, I have called on Al many times for counsel in perplexity or distress. He has always been there for me on the spot with uh, care, with patience, which was often needed, and with, and with wisdom. And I have been extremely grateful for all that care and all that counsel. Mark Twain said that a classic is a book everybody wants to have read and nobody wants to read. <laughs> and maybe there's a similar point about lives. There are lives that everybody wants to have led and that nobody, very few people, that is, very few people actually lead because of the labor and the strength of character needed to live them. And I think Al has had a luminous life of that sort. At any rate, what I want to say is that for me, he has been a kind of North Star, guiding me in the direction I would like my own life to go. And I have been very grateful for his witness and his help over the years. And so here's what I want to say. He can retire from Notre Dame if he wants to, <clears throat> but I don't see any reason for letting him retire as the pater familias he has been to the visible and the invisible SCP. So that's it. And here's the paper. <clears throat> In his essay, Superlapsarianism, Alvin Plantinga tries to base a solution to the problem of evil on the value of the atonement. By atonement in this connection, Plantinga means that which is accomplished by the passion, death, and resurrection of Jesus, understood as incarnate deity, fully human and fully God. And that's also the way in which I will understand atonement in this paper. Plantinga says, consider the splendid and gracious marvel of incarnation and atonement. I believe that the great goodness of this state of affairs, like that of the divine existence itself, makes its value incommensurable with the value of states of affairs involving creaturely good and bad. No matter how much evil, how much sin and suffering a world contains, 
the aggregated badness would be outweighed by the goodness of incarnation and atonement, outweighed in such a way that the world in question is very good. But then this gives us a very straightforward and simple response to the question, why is there evil in the world? The response is that God wanted to create a highly eligible world, wanted to actualize one of the best of all the possible worlds. All those worlds contain atonement. Hence, they all contain sin and evil. If a theodicy is an attempt to explain why God permits evil, what we have here is a theodicy, and if I'm right, a successful theodicy. In this paper, I don't want to examine planning a theodicy. And here I have to tell you that I'm going to uh, skip around hugely in the printed version of the paper. And so for the next two sections of the paper, you'll be better off just listening than following. And I'll tell you when we resume with what's in the text. Instead of investigating planning as claim that the value of the atonement can be the basis of a successful theodicy, I want to examine... I want to examine planning as position, the obvious presupposition of planning as position, namely that there's a very great value in the atonement. I don't disagree with them on this score. I sure hope you hear me. I don't disagree with them on this score, on the value of the atonement. I share this view with them. But I want to try to understand better this view that I share with them. So what is, in fact, valuable about the atonement? Although the answer to this question might seem elementary, on reflection, the question turns out to be remarkably difficult to deal with. Any attempt to answer it depends on finding an answer to another, even more difficult question, what is the atonement? Since the answer to the first question about the value of the atonement obviously depends on the answer to the second one about the nature of the atonement, I'm going to concentrate on the second one here. It isn't going to be possible in this short paper to present and defend an answer to the question. So don't get your hopes up. This is all about problems, not about answers. But I hope to show some of the possibilities for answers and the difficulties associated with each of them. So this paper raises more questions than it answers. But my hope is that seeing the questions more clearly will itself be a contribution to discussion about the answers. So the nature of the problem. We can begin reflection on the question about the nature of the atonement by considering the purpose of the atonement. There is little, if any, controversy in theology and the difficulties associated with each of them. So this paper raises more questions than it answers, but my hope is that seeing the questions more clearly will itself be a contribution to discussion about the answers. So the nature of the problem. We can begin reflection on the question about the nature of the atonement by considering the purpose of the atonement. There is little, if any, controversy in theological circles now or in the history of Christian philosophy and theology over the claim that the atonement is a solution to a problem. But what's the problem? The word atonement was coined to express the nature of the solution And so the word itself gives us a direction in which to go to understand the character of the problem. Atonement is an invented word composed of at and one jammed together with meant. And it was devised to express the idea that the atonement is a making one of things that were previously not at one, namely God and human beings. So if at one meant is the solution to a problem, then it seems the problem should be thought of as the absence of unity between God and human beings. As Augustine and the Christian tradition after him see the problem, its source lies in the will. It consists in the will's intractability to itself, its proneness to moral evil or sin, even against its own desires for the good. Without doubt, This impairment in the will is correlated also with impairment in intellect. But as Augustine and the subsequent tradition tend to see it, the fundamental defect is in the will. On views such as Augustine's, this fragmentation in the will, this proneness to moral evil or sin, is the problem to which the atonement is the solution. 
In what follows, I'm going to assume that this view is standard for orthodox interpretations of the doctrine of the atonement, and I'm going to take it for granted in thinking about interpretations of the doctrine. That brings me to elements, the elements of the problem, and this is the point at which your uh, text will be uh, on track with what I'm saying. So understood, the problem to which the atonement is the solution has multiple components, and they need correspondingly different remedies in any solution to the problem that is to be successful. In the first place, there is the very proneness to sin itself. While this defect in will remains in a person, it makes a person liable to wrongdoing in the future. That this is so, and widely known to be so, undermines community and impedes closeness between persons. Our laws, customs, and manners are designed to protect each of us against the others because each of us knows that any of the others is capable even of great evils, of betraying trust, of breaking relationships, of things as terrible as molesting a child. In fact, the defect in the will not only makes it difficult for a person to live with others, it also makes it difficult for him to live with himself. One can distrust oneself as well as others, and such distrust is an additional obstacle to human closeness with others. One source of a person's insecurity in relationships is the fear on his part that if others really knew him, they would want to reject him. If fear and insecurity get the upper hand in a psyche, they can have the added disadvantage of producing greater or lesser degrees of self-deception. A person can shield himself from things about himself he's unable or unwilling to face, with the result that he becomes seriously self-deceived about himself. And of course, suppressing parts of one's personality or hiding oneself from oneself in self-deception only increases distance from others. One is then alienated both from oneself and from others. It's not hard to understand why a person prone to sin would be subject to anxiety and even depression. For all these reasons, the defect in the will is a serious obstacle to flourishing in one's own life and in one's relations to other persons. And of course, for these same or similar reasons, it's also a major source of distance from God. These difficulties constitute the first component in the problem of sin to which I want to call attention. We can think of it as the future-looking component of the problem, whose source is the defect in the human will, insofar as its effects are felt in the present to be destructive of human flourishing in relationship with other persons, including God most notably in the time that is future with respect to now. But there is obviously also a component to the problem of human sin that has to do with the past. On Christian doctrine, with the exception of the incarnate Christ, every human person who does not die before the age of reason, whenever that might be, is not only prone to sin, but has also actually done sinful actions. Every such person can look back to a past in which he has done things that are serious moral wrongs and that go contrary to God's will and or God's nature. The result is that every person past the age of reason suffers from guilt with regard to at least some past actions. I don't mean that every person suffers from feelings of guilt. That's no doubt true, but it's not my point here. The point is that every person past the age of reason is actually guilty whether he feels it or not. His life history includes his having done serious moral wrongs and guilt, his life, his life history includes his having done serious moral wrongs and guilt is not the end of the problem as regards past sin. There's also shame. That's part of the backward looking component of the problem engendered by the defect in the human will too. Here also I don't mean that every person guilty of moral wrongdoing feels shame in consequence of what he's done no doubt shame is ubiquitous too. But I mean only that in consequence of past sin, a person in fact is shamed, somehow less lovely or less honorable than he might have been had he not sinned. No one doubts that guilt and shame are distinct, but there's considerable controversy over the nature of the distinction. 
Another work I've argued that when guilt and shame are both present and felt, the difference between shame and guilt can be understood in terms of the two desires of love on the account of love I've defended elsewhere. I can't recapitulate that whole discussion here, but roughly summarized on this account, love consists in two mutually interacting desires, a desire for the good of the beloved and a desire for union with the beloved. A shame person and a guilty person each anticipates a repudiation on the part of real or imagined others of both the desires of love as regards himself. But a person in the grip of guilt will tend to be focused more on the first desire, and a person suffering from shame will tend to worry more about the second. That is, a guilty person anticipates anger on the part of real or imagined others. And so he's anxious about things others may impose on him which are punishments in their view and which are not for his good in some sense of good in his view. His concern is therefore that real or imagined others will lack for him the first desire of love, the desire for the good for him as he sees it. By contrast, a shamed person anticipates rejection and abandonment on the part of real or imagined others. And so he's anxious about marginalization or isolation. His anxiety is directed toward a distance, an absence of union forced on him by others with whom he himself desires some kind of closeness. His worry is therefore that real or imagined others will lack for him the second desire of love, the desire for union with him. So a person who feels guilty believes it would be appropriate for others to be angry at him and to punish him where the punishment is something he doesn't want because he doesn't see it as good for himself. But a person who feels shamed believes it would be appropriate for others to reject not his good, but him. And of course, when the person whose punishment or rejection is feared is God, the problems of guilt and shame are correspondingly much greater. On this way of thinking about shame, it's more intractable than guilt. We're accustomed to think of the antidote to guilt as repentance and forgiveness, or maybe as repentance, forgiveness, and penance. Shame, however, is a response to one's deformity in consequence of something in the history of one's life. And that history, like everything else about the past, is fixed and unalterable. On the view of virtually all philosophers and theologians, even thinking about shame, it's more intractable than guilt. We're accustomed to think of the antidote to guilt as repentance and forgiveness, or maybe as repentance, forgiveness, and penance. Shame, however, is a response to one's deformity in consequence of something in the history of one's life. And that history, like everything else about the past, is fixed and unalterable. On the view of virtually all philosophers and theologians, even God can't change the past. So one's life history remains what it was. For these reasons, a remedy for shame seems much harder to come by than a remedy for guilt. So the problem of human sin is both future-looking and backward-looking, and it includes three elements, you might say. A current dispositions with their liability to future sin, and past sinful actions with their consequent guilt and shame. Insofar as the atonement is a solution to the problem of sin, these are the elements of the problem that it must somehow remedy if it is to be a successful solution. The long complicated history of interpretation of the doctrine of the atonement is marked by three main kinds of theories about the obstacles to any remedy for the problem of the human tendency to sin. The first of these theories, popular in the patristic period and much more neglected since then, locates the main obstacle in the power of Satan. It sees Satan as having a hold over human beings because of the human tendency to evil. On this theory, in some morally or legally appropriate way, human sin put human beings in the control of Satan, who held sway over them with some justice or some, as it were, legal rights. By trying to extend his control over human beings to the incarnate deity in the passion and death of Christ, 
Satan somehow lost whatever justice or legal rights he had with regard to his domination of human beings. In consequence, through the effects of Christ's passion and death on the reign of Satan, human beings were redeemed from slavery to sin. Now, whatever the interest or the merits of this patristic kind of theory may be, it's hard to see interpretations of this kind as full or complete accounts of the doctrine of the atonement. How could an interpretation of this kind explain the removal of either guilt or shame, for example? And of course, at least from the time of Anselm onwards, other types of theories have eclipsed this one. Historically considered, this patristic theory has been in abeyance for a long time. The two main competing kinds of theories from Anselm's time onwards are divided by their preference for locating the main obstacle to the remedy for human sin, either in God or in human beings. You might naturally suppose that these two different kinds of theory are the Catholic and the Protestant kinds. You might, especially in this audience, suppose that. <clears throat> but this would be a mistaken way of categorizing the kinds in question. In my view, there are Catholic interpretations to be found in both the different kinds of theories. It is less easy to say whether Protestant interpretations come in both kinds as well, but that's at least in part because it's not always easy to interpret the details of the major Protestant theories. Still, it's not hard to see the interpretations of the atonement given by Calvin and Luther as falling largely or entirely into one kind of theory. Anselm's interpretation of the doctrine should be assigned to this kind too. On the accounts of the interpretations in this group, the chief obstacle to the remedy for human sin lies in something about God. The other kind of theory can be suitably represented by the interpretation of the doctrine given by Aquinas. For this second kind of theory, the primary impediment to finding a solution for the problem of human sin lies in human beings themselves. In this short paper, all I can do is to sketch the lineaments of these two kinds of interpretations and the difficulties attending each of them. I'll begin with the first kind, the Anselmian kind of theory. Interpretations of the doctrine of the atonement suitably grouped into that first Anselmian kind often locate the main obstacle to a solution to the problem of human sin in God's honor or God's justice or some similar divine attribute or attributes. As the proponents of interpretations in this first kind see it, in consequence of their proneness to sin, human beings have violated God's righteous commands or otherwise acted contrary to God's goodness, and so have offended God. This offense against God generates something like a moral debt, and that debt is so enormous that human beings by themselves can never repay it. Although God has the power to cancel the debt in some sense of power, he is nonetheless unable to do so. That's because it would be a violation of God's justice to cancel a moral debt, or it would be in some other way incompatible with his goodness, or it would be a blot on his honor, or something else along these lines. Instead, God's justice or honor or some other divine attribute requires that the full debt owed be paid. Therefore, God cannot simply forgive a person's sin. Instead, because of the relevant divine attributes, God must impose the just punishment for human sin. In his influential treatise on the atonement, Cur Deus Homo, which gives us one classic exemplar of such uh, interpretation of the doctrine, Anselm says, there is nothing more intolerable in the universal order than that a creature should take away honor from the creator and not repay what he takes away. There is nothing which it is more unjust to tolerate than the most intolerable thing in the universal order it is a necessary consequence, therefore, that either the honor which has been taken away should be repaid or punishment should follow. Otherwise, either God will not be just to himself or he will be without the power to enforce either of the two options. And it is an abominable sin even to consider this possibility. 
Interpretations of the doctrine of the atonement in this first kind of theory consequently tend to emphasize the passion and death of Christ as paying the penalty for human beings. On interpretations in this first kind of theory, then, God is not only perfectly just, but also infinitely merciful, and so he brings it about that he himself pays the human debt in full by assuming human nature as the incarnate Christ, and in that nature enduring the penalty which would otherwise have had to be imposed in justice on human beings. And then, because the incarnate Christ has paid in full the penalty owed by human beings, human sins are forgiven. For this reason, by God's mercy exercised through Christ's passion and death, human beings are saved from sin. Anselm sums up this view by saying, the restoration of human nature could not have been brought about unless man repaid what he owed to God. This debt was so large that although no one but man owed it, only God was capable of repaying it, assuming that there should be a man identical with God. The life of this man is so sublime and so precious that it can suffice to repay the debt owed for the sins of the whole world and infinitely more besides. By contrast, Interpretations of the doctrine suitably grouped into the second kind of theory typically locate the obstacle to a remedy for human sin in human beings themselves. In my view, Aquinas' interpretation of the doctrine is a good exemplar of this second kind. For Aquinas, the chief obstacle to human salvation from sin is that a human will doesn't will the good or even want to will the good. By the objective, non-relativized standards of God, every human being except Christ has a will infected with the radical human tendency toward moral evil. On the interpretation of the atonement that Aquinas inherits and develops, the solution to the problem of human sin consists in the paired processes of justification and sanctification. On Aquinas' view, without violating human free will, God's operative grace produces in a human being a will for a will that wills the good, and God's cooperative grace works with that partially healed human will to increase in it the strength for willing the good. For Aquinas, Christ's passion and death produced many good effects for human beings, but the main one is that of providing the grace that heals the defect in the human will through the processes of justification and sanctification. So, for example, Aquinas says, grace was bestowed on Christ, not only as an individual, but inasmuch as he is the head of the church, so that grace might open. For Aquinas, Christ's passion and death produced many good effects for human beings, but the main one is that of providing the grace that heals the defect in the human will through the processes of justification and sanctification. So, for example, Aquinas says, grace was bestowed on Christ, not only as an individual, but inasmuch as he is the head of the church, so that grace might overflow into his members. And therefore, Christ's works are referred to himself and to his members. Consequently, Christ, by his passion, merited salvation, not only for himself, but likewise for all his members. On the kind of interpretation represented by Aquinas' account, then, the passion and death of Christ are a solution to the problem of human sin because they are responsible for the grace that heals the human will. So that very, very roughly sketched is the two different kinds of interpretation. In my view, interpretations of both these kinds raise perplexities and concerns, and at best, each of them also seems incomplete as a solution to the problem of human sin. So consider to begin with interpretations of the first Anselmian kind. There are problems internal to the interpretations grouped into this kind. To start with one of the ones that seems to me obvious, contrary to what interpretations of this kind intend, they don't in fact seem to present God as forgiving human sin for someone to forgive a debtor is to fail to exact all that is injustice owed to him. But on interpretations of the Anselmian kind, 
God does exact every bit of the debt owed to him by human beings. He allows none of it to go unpaid. It's true that the debt is paid by the incarnate deity, but what this element in this interpretation shows is only that God himself has arranged for the debt to be paid in full, not that he's agreed to overlook or forego any part of it. There may be something specially benevolent in God's paying to himself what is owed to him, but it remains the case that no part of the debt owed is left unpaid. Furthermore, although interpretations of the first kind mean to emphasize God's justice, the account they give of the way in which the debt is paid seems actually to rest on a denial of justice. On the Anselmian sort of interpretation, it's a violation of God's goodness or justice not to punish the sins of human persons guilty of those sins. But according to the Anselmian interpretation, what God does to act compatibly with his justice is in fact to fail to punish the guilty. Since on this interpretation, guilty human beings don't get the punishment they deserve. What God does instead is to visit that deserved punishment on an innocent person. I would say that the most obvious divine attribute operative in the atonement on the Anselmian interpretation is not God's justice. How is justice served by punishing a completely innocent person? And if God could, after all, forego punishing the guilty, contrary to what the Anselmian interpretation insists on in theory, then why didn't God just do so? And what justice or goodness is served by God's inflicting someone else's deserved suffering on an innocent person who doesn't deserve it. In addition to these difficulties internal to such interpretations, there are also external difficulties. That's because it's not clear how interpretations of this Anselmian kind remedy the problem to which the atonement is meant to be the solution. Even if, contrary to the objections I've raised, such interpretations do manage to preserve God's justice, even if they succeed in explaining how the debt of punishment incurred by human sin is forgiven, it seems that for such interpretations, the forward-looking problem of human sin remains. Nothing about the atonement on such interpretations of the doctrines alters the human proneness to sin. Even if on such Anselmian interpretations, the atonement is efficacious to remove the penalty a human being incurs in sinning, the human proclivity to sin is not removed just by paying the debt for past sin. As far as that goes, not even all the backward-looking problem is solved. Past sin leaves a person with shame over what he now is, namely a person who has done such things. But having an innocent person suffer the penalty incurred by one's own sin doesn't take away that shame. If anything, it seems to add to it, because there is something very shaming about being responsible for the horrible suffering of an innocent person, even if that suffering was voluntarily undertaken on one's behalf. In George Eliot's Middle March, when Fred Vinci is stricken with guilt and shame, over his inability to pay the debts he incurred through profligate gambling. Part of what makes the shame worse for him is that at great cost to himself, his friend Caleb Garth pays part of that debt for him. Interpretations of the second Thomistic sort have this one advantage of showing why the problem of human sin is solved. The operative and cooperative grace of God received in the paired processes of justification and sanctification is the means by which the defect in the human will is remedied. By grace, through these processes, over time, the forward-looking problem of sin is solved. As for the part of the backward-looking problem of sin involving guilt and a debt of punishment for sins committed, Aquinas supposes, contrary to Anselm, that God's justice does not require that the debt of punishment be paid. Aquinas says, if God had willed to free human beings from sin without any satisfaction, God would not have acted against justice. If God forgives sin which has the formality of fault 
In that it is committed against himself, he wrongs no one. Just as anyone else overlooking a personal trespass without satisfaction acts mercifully and not unjustly. And so for Aquinas, guilt is healed by God's forgiveness alone. And the backward-looking problem of shame also has at least some remedy, just because grace remedies the forward-looking problem of the proneness to sin. Grace heals a person who is prone to sin. And so in that sense, it makes him a new person. But is shame attached to the acts he did as the old person, the person he used to be before he was healed by grace? And so although a human being healed by grace recognizes that he did those acts, nonetheless he accepts that he is no longer the person he was. And to this extent, the shame of his past actions no longer attaches to him now. So interpretations of the Thomistic kind have these advantages over interpretations of the Anselmian kind. Nonetheless, like the Anselmian kind of interpretation, the Thomistic kind has both external and internal problems. To begin with the obvious internal problems, it seemed hard to many people, even to those who are generally in the Thomas camp, to see how God can be thought to remedy the defect in the human will without taking away the freedom of the human will. If God's grace introduced into the will is what makes the will inclined to the good or strengthened in its inclinations to the good, then it seems as if God has determined the human will. On incompatibilist views of freedom, the will's freedom is thereby undermined or destroyed. More importantly, from my point of view, there are also external problems for the Thomistic kind of interpretation, the most considerable of which is this. How are we to understand the connection between the giving of grace and Christ's passion and death? As the quotation I just read from Aquinas makes clear, Aquinas does not think that God's forgiveness requires the passion and death of Christ or any kind of payment of the debt of punishment incurred by sin. In fact, Aquinas thinks that God could have saved human beings from sin without Christ's passion and death. Aquinas says, simpliciter and absolutely, it was possible for God to deliver human beings otherwise than by the passion of Christ, because nothing is impossible with God. If the problem of sin is solved by God's giving of grace, then it's hard to see how to avoid the conclusion that Christ's passion and death are irrelevant to the remedy for the problem of human sin. On the face of it, it seems obviously possible for God to give grace, healing the human proneness to sin, just by willing to do so than by the passion of Christ, because nothing is impossible with God. If the problem of sin is solved by God's giving of grace, then it's hard to see how to avoid the conclusion that Christ's passion and death are irrelevant to the remedy for the problem of human sin. On the face of it, it seems obviously possible for God to give grace, healing the human proneness to sin, just by willing to do so. At any rate, the only reason easy to see for supposing that it's not possible for God to do so has to do with the sort of reflections about God's justice raised by Anselm and others. And this is a reason Aquinas rejects, as the quotation I read earlier shows. So it seems as if on the Thomistic theory, Christ's passion and death are gratuitous. And of course, gets worse if they're gratuitous, then it's unjust on God's part to require that Christ suffer and die, since it's unjust to require an innocent person to suffer for a good that could be gotten just as well without the suffering. Worse yet, on Aquinas' sort of interpretation, Christ's passion and death seem not only gratuitous, but in fact, inefficacious. Not only could the good in question be apparently gotten without Christ's passion and death, but it seems that Christ's passion and death have no intrinsic role at all in the production of this good. To see this implication, let it be the case for the sake of argument that God cannot or will not give grace to human beings without Christ's passion and death. Still, what is there about Christ's passion and death themselves that are connected to this grace? 
If Christ's passion and death are to be efficacious as the remedy for human sin, then it seems that there ought to be something about the passion and death of Christ that are themselves somehow intrinsically suited to be the means for grace. But it's difficult to see what connection there could be between Christ's suffering and dying on one hand and God's giving the grace that heals the human will on the other hand, unless, of course, we accept an Anselmian sort of interpretation. And this is what the Thomistic sort of interpretation means to reject. It's not the case, as the preceding quotation showed, it's not the case for Thomistic interpretations that God's unable to give grace to human beings without the passion and death of Christ. So each of these two main kinds of theory, the Anselmian and the Thomistic, suffers from problems stemming from the particular character of the interpretations falling into that kind. In addition, however, both of these kinds share a vulnerability to two further difficulties. Here's the first one. There is reason to expect that there would be some connection between the good brought about by the passion and death of Christ on the one hand and the good involved in God's reason for allowing the particular suffering of any particular human being, however that reason is explained. Whatever the reason God has for allowing the suffering of that person at that time in that way, it seems that her suffering somehow needs to conduce to her ultimate good. But salvation from sin for the sake of union with God does seem to be the ultimate good for all post-fall human beings on the assumption common to both kinds of interpretation of the doctrine of the atonement. And so it seems that there should be some intrinsic connection between successful interpretations of the doctrine of the atonement and successful attempts at theodicy or defense at explaining why particular people suffer what they suffer. The benefit provided for a particular sufferer by means of her suffering ought to have some connection to the good brought about by Christ's passion and death. On the Anselmian kind of interpretation, however, the good that comes to human beings from Christ's passion and death has to do simply with God's ability to save human beings while preserving his justice. And for this good, Christ's passion and death are sufficient. This good is available for human beings whether they suffer or not. Since this is so, it is hard to see what connection there could be between this good and the good that comes to a particular person from her suffering. The ultimate good for her, as for all human beings, is provided completely and solely by the passion and death of Christ and its effects on God. I'm not trying to say here that the Anselmian sort of interpretation makes the Odyssey harder. That's not the point. If planning is right, a theodicy can be constructed out of considerations based on the value of the atonement alone, since the value of the atonement is so great that it outweighs any disvalue of sin and suffering. My point is different. My point is only that on Anselmian sorts of interpretation of the doctrine of the atonement, it's hard to see a natural or intrinsic connection between the good brought about by Christ's atonement and any goods putatively justifying God in allowing the particular suffering of any particular human being other than Christ. The same sort of difficulty afflicts interpretations of the Thomistic kind. On a Thomistic sort of interpretation, Christ's passion and death are meant to be somehow connected to the grace that God gives to human beings to remedy the defect of will in them. But if Christ's passion and death or God's love and goodness and the giving of grace, or both, are sufficient to provide this grace for human beings, as the Thomistic theory claims it is, then it's not clear what connection there is between saving grace on the one hand and whatever goods might defeat the particular suffering of any particular person. For the Thomistic sort of interpretation, as for the Anselmian, the ultimate good for all human beings is completely provided by Christ's passion and death. For interpretations of both kind, then, since Christ's passion and death are sufficient to provide the greatest good for human beings, however that good is understood 
and whatever the interpretation is of the means to it constituted by Christ's passion and death, it's not clear what role is left for human suffering. On each kind of theory, the specific connection between the doctrine of the atonement and theodicy, which ought to be apparent, is hard to conceive. Secondly, interpretations of both kinds were developed on the basis of reflections about the narrative of the passion and death of Christ given by each of the four Gospels. For that reason, one check on the adequacy of each kind of theory is its fit with those narratives. But consider just the powerful detail in the Gospel narratives of Christ's cry of dereliction from the cross. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Although this is a quotation from Psalm 22, Christian tradition has generally taken Christ's uttering it to indicate his own experience of being forsaken by God. It is hard to see, however, that either the Anselmian or Thomistic kind of interpretation has the resources to explain Christ having such an experience. Interpretations of the Thomistic kind are the most disadvantaged here. If the point of Christ's passion and death is a loving God's providing grace that remedies the defect in human beings, then what about this process would drive any kind of wedge between Christ and God? In fact, it's part of Aquinas' own interpretation of the passion and death of Christ that even while Christ suffers in his human nature, he's also completely united to God in his human nature. Interpretations of the Anselmian kind might be thought more promising in this connection, since they present the passion and death of Christ primarily as a propitiation of a perfectly just God offended at human sin. Calvin goes so far as to suppose that in the process of dying, as part of Christ taking on the punishment merited by sinful human beings, Christ experiences the torments of hell and feels them as appropriately imposed on him. But even interpretations of this kind seem hard-pressed to explain the cry of dereliction, interpreted as an expression of an experience of abandonment by God. That's because interpretations of this Anselmian kind emphasize both God's justice and Christ's innocence. An innocent man might suffer physical pain for the sake of the guilty, even terrible physical punishment of the sort some people assume there is in hell. But how could an innocent man be abandoned by a just God? What justice would there be in a just God separating himself from a human person who is himself perfectly just? And what would the separation consist in? Separation from God is not a matter of physical distance. It's a matter of opposition in wills. Pain for the sake of the guilty, even terrible physical punishment of the sort some people assume there is in hell. But how could an innocent man be abandoned by a just God? What justice would there be in a just God separating himself from a human person who is himself perfectly just? And what would the separation consist in? Separation from God is not a matter of physical distance. It's a matter of opposition in wills. But how could the will of a perfectly good God be in opposition to the will of a perfectly good human being? So adequacy to the biblical narratives is yet another problem shared by interpretations of both the Anselmian and the Thomistic kinds. So here's what I want to say in conclusion. The doctrine of the atonement differs from other major Christian doctrines, such as the doctrine of the incarnation, for example, in having no formula specifying its interpretation. There's no Chalcedonian formula of the atonement, for example. For this reason, it's possible for there to be highly divergent interpretations, all of which are orthodox and therefore all of which are in some sense acceptable. In this short paper, I've concentrated on highlighting the problems for the two main kinds of theories into which varying orthodox and acceptable interpretations of the doctrine of the atonement fall. So here's what I want to make sure everybody hears. My point is not to cast doubt on the doctrine or to make anybody depressed or to make anybody <laughs> want to go home and not be able to sleep. <laughs> 
On the contrary, I want to make sure you understand I share Plantinga's evident commitment to the truth of the doctrine, and I share his view of the value of the atonement. But it seems to me that Augustine and Anselm have a point in valuing faith-seeking understanding. And it seems to me that we can't understand the doctrine as well as we might without first seeing the difficulties faced by the major kinds of theories attempting to interpret it. My hope is that a clearer view of the difficulties both these kinds of theory face will lead to deeper understanding of the not yet fully developed resources in the history of the interpretation of the doctrine or in the biblical narratives themselves, which, in my view, undoubtedly do have the resources for dealing successfully with these and other difficulties raised by the doctrine. For my part, I'm optimistic that these resources in the biblical narratives and the history of the tradition may be together with some of the new work in philosophy, in psychology, especially the new work on the nature of the second person will now be employed to such good effect elsewhere in philosophy. My, I'm optimistic that all these resources will be of considerable help here. But obviously that's the subject for another paper, another work, and for now it's enough for what I wanted to do here to point out where we might profitably focus for further reflection. Commentator is E.J. Kaufman, and E.J., if you will read quickly, then we'll have time for comments and questions. Sure, sure. I should say quickly. Uh, I'm one of Al's more recent students. I graduated in May of 2006. A very quick story about Al. Um, early on in my coursework at Notre Dame, Al cheerfully agreed to do an independent study with me and a couple other students on skepticism and contextualism. At the very beginning of that course, you, you can imagine I was quite excited about this independent study. Uh, the very beginning of that course, I typed up a page of random thoughts about an assigned reading um, and left that page in Al's department mailbox. The next time I checked my mailbox, day or two later, Al had returned that page and at the bottom had written, right, exclamation point, Al. Uh, and I've, I've kept that page uh, as, as, as one of, I mean, so, so two reasons, as one of many reminders um, of Al's great generosity and warmth. Uh, but I've also used it to resolve disputes, both at work and at home. So, you know, I, look, I'm sorry, I'm right. Al says so. Holding the document, okay. Eleanor explores the problem of human sin that the atonement is meant to solve, helpfully uncovering important adequacy conditions for theories of atonement. She then uses those conditions to evaluate two main kinds of theories of atonement, Anselmian and Thomistic. One of her main claims is that the Thomist outperforms the Anselmian on the atonement-motivating problem of human sin. I bring good news and bad news. Good news. Eleanor's two seemingly independent further problems for theorists of atonement, discussed near the end of her paper, in fact reduce to a single challenge, at least I'll try to reduce them to a single challenge, which suggests a strategy for future theorizing about the atonement. The bad news, Eleanor's case that the Thomist outperforms the Anselmian on the problem of human sin is weaker than it initially appears. As we'll see, Eleanor's own account of shame implies that the Anselmian's difficulties on this front are less serious than she claims. Starting with the good news, Eleanor's two apparently independent further problems for theorists of atonement actually reduce to a single challenge. Call the first of Eleanor's challenges for theorists of atonement C1, enable an explanation of human suffering. Recall Eleanor's argument that successful theorists of atonement will meet C1, quoting Eleanor, Whatever the reason God has for allowing the suffering of a given human person at that time in that way, it seems that her suffering somehow needs to conduce to her ultimate good. But salvation from sin for the sake of union with God does seem to be the ultimate good for all human beings. And so it seems that there should be some intrinsic connection between successful interpretations of the doctrine of the atonement and successful attempts at theodicy or defense. <laughs> 
This echoes a main argument of Al's 2004 paper on superlapsarianism, hereafter Al's supra paper. I would try to say Al's super supra paper, but that's, that's too tough. Reviewing Al's somewhat less compressed line of thought bolsters Eleanor's claim that any adequate theory of atonement will meet C1. So consider this excerpt from Al's super paper. Much of this appears near the beginning of Eleanor's paper. Quoting Al, I believe that the great goodness of incarnation and atonement makes its value incommensurable with the value of states of affairs involving creaturely good and bad. Thus, the value of incarnation and atonement cannot be matched by any aggregate of creaturely goods. No matter how many excellent creatures there are in a world, no matter how rich and beautiful and sinless their lives, the aggregated value of their lives would not match that of incarnation and atonement. Any world with incarnation and atonement would be better yet. And no matter how much evil, how much sin and suffering a world contains, the aggregated badness would be outweighed by the goodness of incarnation and atonement in such a way that the world in question is very good. This strongly suggests the following thesis, G. Among the greatest goods any human person can enjoy is reunion with God the Father after suffering voluntary, sin-induced separation from the Father. Now, if something like G is right, a main lesson of Al's supra paper can kick in. Claims like G yield an explanation of human suffering. Start with God's desire to actualize a really good world that includes humans. By G, one of our greatest goods, significantly outlawing any suffering we might endure, is a reunion with the Father after suffering voluntary, sin-induced separation from him. Really good human-including worlds will thus include atonement. Since any world containing atonement must also feature sin and suffering, really good human-including worlds must feature sin and suffering. We now have an atonement-based explanation of human suffering. Quoting Al, but then this gives us a very straightforward and simple response to the question, why is there evil in the world? The response is that God wanted to actualize one of the best of all the possible worlds. All those worlds contain atonement, hence they all contain sin and evil. So provided that G is not only correct, but also yields an explanation of human suffering, any adequate theory of atonement will honor G and thereby yield, via argumentation like that in Al's super paper, an explanation of human suffering. Hence, Eleanor's claim that any successful theory of atonement must meet condition one, C1. What we haven't yet seen, though, is this. Any theory of atonement that honors G will thereby also meet the second of Eleanor's two further challenges for theorists of atonement, which we'll label C2, explain Christ's experience of abandonment on the cross. Here I need two assumptions. A1, being fully human and morally perfect, Christ enjoys all the greatest goods for human people, at least all such goods that can be enjoyed by someone who's also fully divine. And A2, notwithstanding the fact he's fully divine, Christ can enjoy reunion with the Father after suffering voluntary of atonement, which we'll label C2, explain Christ's experience of abandonment on the cross. Here I need two assumptions. A1, being fully human and morally perfect, Christ enjoys all the greatest goods for human people, at least all such goods that can be enjoyed by someone who's also fully divine. And A2, notwithstanding the fact he's fully divine, Christ can enjoy reunion with the Father after suffering voluntary sin-induced separation from him. A1 seems uncontroversial, uh, but, but there are obvious worries about A2. I'll discuss one of them now. To see... Uh, Perhaps the most obvious where he just, just note something obvious, Christ's voluntary sin-induced separation from the Father differs at least slightly from ours. We voluntarily separ separate ourselves from the Father by being sinful. Christ, by contrast, voluntarily suffers separation from the Father due to our sinfulness. In light of these points, Christ himself may start seeming like a counterexample to G. That is, a human person such that the state of affairs being reunited with the Father after suffering voluntary sin-induced separation from the Father isn't among the greatest goods for him, although that's surely great for us. Do reflection suggest, though, that such appearances mislead? Briefly, in freely suffering separation from the Father on our, his enemy's, behalf, Christ enacts, quote, perfectly loving character, altogether free of hate toward other agents, in perfect obedience 
to his perfectly righteous Father's will. That's a quotation from a recent paper on sin and salvation by Paul Moser. We can plausibly count the performance of self-giving, enemy-loving acts like this, including less exalted ones within reach of non-divine humans, as among the greatest goods for humans. So supposing A1 and A2 are correct, G implies that Christ will himself enjoy reunion with the Father after suffering voluntary sin-induced separation from him. An elegant explanation of Christ's experience of abandonment on the cross emerges. At some point, Christ really is separated from the Father because of our sin and for our sake. Christ has a veridical experience of that separation from which his haunting cry of dereliction bursts forth. And so we see that any theory of atonement that honors G can also explain Christ's experience of abandonment on the cross, thus meeting C2. Combining the results of the last few paragraphs, we get this. Any theory of atonement must honor G and will thereby meet both C1 and C2. Um, if that's right, then meeting C1 and C2 can be reduced to the challenge of honoring G. This suggests a strategy for future theorizing about the atonement. In hopes of reducing total workload, focus on theories of atonement that show promise of justifying G. Again, the claim that among the greatest human goods uh, is reunion with the Father after suffering some sort, uh, the sort you're able to suffer, voluntary sin-induced separation from the Father. I'm happy to report that theorists of atonement face fewer problems than we might have thought. By contrast, it gives me only a, a very little pleasure, I assure you, uh, to report what I think is my bad news. Um, Eleanor's case that the Thomist outperforms the Anselmian on the atonement motivating problem of human sin is weaker than it initially appears. One of Eleanor's key claims here, remember, is that the Anselmian approach fails to fully solve what Eleanor helpfully describes and dubs the backward-looking problem of human sin and makes no progress at all on what Eleanor again helpfully describes and dubs the forward-looking problem of human sin. These are serious charges. As Eleanor helps us see, any adequate theory of atonement must make clear how the atonement can solve these problems. Here's what I'm going to argue in what remains. Given the specific accounts of guilt and, more importantly, shame, that Eleanor employs. The Anselmian can fully solve the backward-looking problem and make considerable progress on the forward-looking problem. This argument saps much, if not all, of the strength from Eleanor's case that the Thomist outperforms the Anselmian relative to the problem of human sin. Start with the backward-looking problem, that is, that the defect of human will when sin springs gives rise to felt guilt and shame. Here again are Eleanor's accounts of those notions, quoting Eleanor. A guilty person anticipates anger on the part of real or imagined others, and so he's anxious about things others may impose on him which are punishments and which are not for his good. His concern is therefore that real or imagined others will lack the desire for the good for him. By contrast, a shamed person anticipates rejection and abandonment on the part of real or imagined others, and so he is anxious about marginalization or isolation. His anxiety is directed toward a distance, an absence of union forced on him by others with whom he himself desires some kind of closeness. His worry is, therefore, that real or imagined others will lack the desire for union with him. A man who feels guilty with respect to his wife and a man who feels shamed before his wife will have different anxieties. There's a psychological difference between the fear of anger and punishment on the one hand and the fear of rejection and abandonment on the other. On Eleanor's accounting, then, to feel guilt is to fear that others won't want your good. And to feel shame is to fear that others won't want to be united with or in union with you. Recall Eleanor's argument that the Anselmian can't, that can't solve the shame component of the backward-looking problem of human sin. And I assume that Eleanor would be willing to grant that the Anselmian can solve the guilt component of the backward-looking problem. She didn't raise that as a problem for the Anselmian, but... Quoting Eleanor, past sin leaves a human person with shame over what he now is, namely, a person who has done such things. But having an innocent person suffer the penalty incurred by one's own sin doesn't take away that shame. If anything, it seems to add to it, because there's something very shaming about being responsible for the horrible suffering of an innocent person, even if that suffering was voluntarily undertaken on one's behalf. Let's state this argument more formally. One. If the Anselmian's right, 
then the atonement involves the innocent Christ voluntarily suffering the penalty your sins incur. Two, if the atonement involves that, then the atonement can only add to your shame. Three, if the atonement can only add to your shame, then the atonement doesn't relieve you of your shame. Conclusion, so if the Anselmian's right, the atonement doesn't relieve you of your shame and so can't solve the shame component of the backward-looking problem of sin that the atonement's supposed to solve. Strong as this argument initially appears, I believe it fails on Eleanor's own account of shame. Somewhat surprisingly, perhaps, two comes out false on her account of shame. And two, again, is the claim that if the atonement involves the innocent Christ voluntarily suffering the penalty your sin incurs, the atonement can only add to your shame. Here's the argument that that premise comes out false on Eleanor's account of shame. One star. You should feel shame only if you should fear that others won't want to be united with or in union with you. Uh, one star follows, I think, from Eleanor's equation of shame with fear that others won't want to be united with you. Two star. If the atonement involves the innocent Christ voluntarily suffering the penalty your sin incurs, then you can know that Christ wants to be united with you. If Christ really has voluntarily suffered the horrible penalty your sin incurs so that you can, quote, join the charm circle of the Trinity itself, that bit is from Al's super paper, then you can be assured that Christ wants to be united with you. Three star, if you can know that Christ wants to be united with you, then you shouldn't fear that others won't want to be united with you. So think here of scriptural passages like Romans 8, 31 through 38. If God's for us, who can be against us? It's God who justifies. Who then can condemn? No one. Christ Jesus who died, more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall, hard, shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or, um, as we say in Tennessee, nakedness uh, or danger or sword? No, in all of these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Um, Romans 8, 31 through 38 entails three star. That's, that's homework. Uh, but, but again, three star is the claim. Uh, if you can know that Christ wants to be united with you, you shouldn't fear that others won't want to be. Four star, if you shouldn't fear that others won't want to be united with you, then you shouldn't feel any shame. That's just the contrapositive of one star, which again, I think follows from Eleanor's equation of shame with fears that others won't want to be in union with you. Conclusion star, C star, so if the atonement involves the innocent Christ voluntarily suffering the penalty your sin incurs, then you shouldn't feel any shame. Uh, C star entails that both, uh, both the denial of two and the denial of C in the formal statement of Eleanor's argument above. The argument for C star both thus threatens both to undercut and to rebut Eleanor's claim that the Anselmian is that others won't want to be in union with you. Conclusion star, C star, so if the atonement involves the innocent Christ voluntarily suffering the penalty your sin incurs, then you shouldn't feel any shame. Uh, C star entails that both, uh, both the denial of two and the denial of C in the formal statement of Eleanor's argument above. The argument for C star both, thus threatens both to undercut and to rebut Eleanor's claim that the Anselmian can't solve the shame component of the backward looking problem. Now, the conjunction of one star through four star strikes me as more plausible than the conjunction of one through three, again, in the formal statement of Eleanor's argument. Um, while each of one star through four star is quite plausible, two, from Eleanor's argument, again, the, the key claim, I think, that if the atonement um, involves the innocent Christ voluntarily suffering the, sin, the penalty your sin incurs, then the atonement can only add to your shame. That doesn't strike me as obvious on its face, and I don't find an attempt to justify it in Eleanor's paper. She seems to treat that as a basic premise. I conclude, then, that we should deny both two and C in the formal statement of Eleanor's argument on the basis of one star through four star. Assuming that the Anselmian can also solve the guilt component of the backward-looking problem, which, remember, Eleanor hasn't questioned, we should conclude, pace Eleanor, that the Anselmian can, in fact, fully solve the backward-looking problem. And the bad news for the Thomist gets at least a little worse. The fact that the Anselmian can solve the shame component 
of the backward-looking problem entails that he can also make considerable progress on the forward-looking problem. That is, that the defect of human will, whence sin springs, makes one liable to future sin, further alienating one from oneself and others, God included. On Eleanor's description of the future-looking problem, one of its key components is present shame over past sin, uh, writes Eleanor. One source of a person's insecurity in human relationships is the fear on his part that if others really knew him, they'd want to reject him. And I, I note that that's the fear with which Eleanor equates shame. If fear and insecurity get the upper hand in a psyche, they can have the added disadvantage of producing greater or lesser degrees of self-deception, ones then alienated both from oneself and from others. It's not hard to understand why a person prone to sin would be subject to anxiety and even depression. Um, and I'll just skip down to uh, the first line of the, the, the paragraph here. These difficulties constitute the first component uh, of, in the problem of sin to which I want to call attention. We can think of that as the future-looking component of the problem. So present shame about past sin does double duty as an element of both past and, more important for present purposes, future-looking problems of human sinfulness. But this implies that the Anselmian can make progress on the future-looking problem, too. Recall Eleanor's pessimism about the Anselmian's prospects for solving the future-looking problem. And this is quoting Eleanor. It seems that for the Anselmian interpretation, the forward-looking problem of human sin remains. Nothing about the atonement on such interpretations of the doctrine alters the human proneness to sin. Even if on such interpretations the atonement is efficacious to remove the penalty a human being incurs in sinning, the human proclivity to sin is not removed just by paying the debt for past sin. As Eleanor correctly suggests elsewhere in her paper, though, mitigating one's present shame over past sin makes future alienation from oneself and others less likely. Presumably, anything that makes future alienation from oneself and others, including God, less likely, thereby ameliorates one's tendency to sin. But we saw earlier that on the Anselmian theory of atonement, plus Eleanor's account of shame, atonement can mitigate present shame over past sin. Despite Eleanor's claims to the contrary, then, we should conclude that the Anselmian can A, fully solve the backward-looking problem of human sin, and B, make at least considerable progress on the future-looking problem. Accordingly, it's unclear to what, if any extent, Eleanor's relevant argumentation supports her claim that the Thomist outperforms the Anselmian on the main problem the atonement is meant to solve. Thanks. Laura Ekstrom tells me that we have virtually no time left, and so I'm going to bank all my response to the comments except just one, uh, which I think I can, um, <laughs> which I think I can uh, get through in very short order. Uh, I want to say also that I'm grateful to EJ for his interesting and helpful comments. I appreciate greatly uh, his uh, spirited defense of the Anselmian uh, theory of the atonement and. Um, I can't possibly do justice to his comments in just a minute or two, but there's just one thing uh, I do want to say. Uh, he says he takes me to be equating shame with the fear of rejection by others, but you know, if you think about it for a minute, you can see that if that were my theory of shame, it would really be very inadequate. And I think he's uh, just got me mixed up on that score. What I said is a person who feels shame believes it would be appropriate for others to reject him. And without that appropriateness, of course, it, you, you aren't really going to get the heart of uh, shame or, or guilt. A shame person might very well continue to believe that it would be appropriate for others to reject him, even if he also believes that those others would actually accept him. And to see the point here real fast, just imagine that because of not because of a metabolic condition or circumstances in her life that excuse her, but just for no reason other than very bad eating habits and a complete failure to exercise, Paula swells up to 450 pounds. And suppose that uh, Paula also knows that her partner Jerome is committed to her and committed to his relationship to her anyway, even so. Why suppose why suppose that Jerome's commitment to her and Paula's recognition of that commitment take away from Paula her shame over being so fat? What Paula can continue to believe even in these circumstances is that it would be entirely understandable, entirely appropriate if Jerome rejected her. 
even if she also knows that Jerome will not do so. Jerome's commitment to her may make Jerome admirable, but it doesn't do the same for Paula. And since Paula can see that this is so, Jerome's commitment to her just by itself is not going to take away from her her shame over her obesity. So the, the fact that Christ is willing to unite with sinful human beings doesn't by itself take away from sinful human beings shame over being a creature of that sort. And so what I want to say at the end is it still seems to me true that in this one respect, the Anselmian, this one respect, the, the Anselmian interpretation doesn't do as well as the Thomistic one. Okay, so we do only have 10 minutes, and we'll follow our practice of using the microphones um, for questions, but... Um, I may call on people not in the order in which you're lined up, so as to give uh, priority to people who haven't had a chance to ask questions in previous sessions. So I'd like to invite people who are in that position to step up and start. Would you like to start? I can make this really quickly. It's more a question, Eleanor. Um, we've, so we've got these two problems, the problem of sin and guilt and the problem of human suffering. I'm willing to be instructed on this, but I guess I need some kind of argument why the solution to one has to be organically connected to the solution to the other. I mean, it would be nice if they were, and they are organically connected in the sense that the solutions will both come from God. But I think you want something a lot stronger than that. And I just, uh, like I say, I'm willing to be taught on this, but I'm just not clear why it can't be the case that there's this one solution to the one problem, and there's a different, not organically connected solution to the other problem. Why do they have to be, why do the same narrative have to uh, solve both problems? Well, I suppose it doesn't, but here's my thought. So um, you want to know why it is that the following very bad things have happened to you and God let them happen. And then uh, people inclined in this direction, inclined to try to give some sort of explanation, will frequently enough point to some sort of good for you. That's how this discussion is going to go. Uh, you're... Um, soul making or something sort you can point to some kind of good for you now presumably whatever good for you we might point to it's going to somehow be on the road to or converge with or somehow otherwise be connected to your ultimate good i mean if it was just a porsche or something we wouldn't understand the explanation but if it's somehow connected in some way to what is the ultimate good for you, then presumably it ought to be connected in some way to what Christ's passion and death provide for you, since what Christ's passion and death provide for you is the ultimate good. So that's a thought. Hi. I just wanted to press a, a point that was brought up in your response to the comments. And uh, so it's a question for both you see what's wrong with the argument, I think. So the conclusion C star connected uh... in some way to what is the ultimate good for you, then presumably it ought to be connected in some way to what Christ's passion and death provide for you, since what Christ's passion and death provide for you is the ultimate good. So that's a thought. Hi. I just wanted to press a, a point that was brought up in your response to the comments. And uh, so it's a question for both you see what's wrong with the argument, I think. So the conclusion C star, uh, uh, consequent that you shouldn't feel any shame, uh, the counterexample that Eleanor just gave, and then my, my thought here is that when we sin, we should feel some sense of shame because we've broken not a relationship with God, but fellowship with God. Uh, there's a break of communion uh, and there's the notion of having godly sorrow or repentance over one's uh, breaking of fellowship in that sort of context. Uh, the proper response to which is a certain amount of shame, I think, that you go again to return to uh, reunite that fellowship with God and not the relationship. Uh, so anyway, I'm just uh, throwing out, uh, if the consequent of C star is false, then what's wrong with the argument? Because uh, that would uh, be a problem for the argument. You know, I'm not sure I followed what you're after here, okay. but um, maybe in the short period of time we have here, maybe this would be a help. 
you're thinking of shame and you're thinking of human moral wrongdoing in what strike me as um, sanitized sort of ways. But focus on the sort of case that's recently been in the news. Suppose you were the Catholic bishop who preceded Cardinal Schoenborn in his position and you've been removed from office because although you've been uh, setting yourself up as a great Catholic moral authority, it turns out that actually you have been sexually molesting children. And now the entire world knows this about you. And now, how are you going to live with this shame? What is there going to be that we can say to you? Or what is there that God can do with you and for you? How is this going to be, in some sense, remedied for you? What I want to say is that for each post-fall human being, if you see your own life from God's point of view, from the point of view of the holy, then what scripture says is you will see yourself as if you were like that cardinal. And if what we say to you is, look, don't worry about it. The loveliest, the holiest, the sweetest person of all suffered horrendous torture. We won't, you know, make you throw up your breakfast by describing them. Suffered horrendous torture so that we can get you past the evil in your life. Now, does that take away your shame? I mean, it seems to me we're going to have to say something more than that to help with the problem. That's the point. Okay, um, I'll, I'll leave it at that. Thanks. Hello. Uh, my question has to do with uh, problems with interpretation of the second kind. Um, you raised the question of how God can be thought to remedy the defect in the human will without taking away the freedom of the will. It says, uh, if God's grace introduced into the will introduced into the will uh, is what makes the will inclined to do the good or at least to strengthen its inclination uh, to the good, then it seems as if God has determined the human will. My question is, uh, is that really a, a liability? And uh, the reason I ask is God is not free to lie, be enticed, or given into temptation, yet we would think that is uh, being a kind of perfection, maybe just what it, parts, just what it means to be um, maxim maximally excellent. Um, and so if I understand the goal of sanctification accurately is to be conformed to the image of Christ and that would seem to include that same perfection God has. Um, so why would gaining that perfection be bad in your view? It wouldn't be bad. It would be terrific for you to have that perfection. The problem is that we want it in your will. Now here's the thing. If what we find in you is not your will but God's will, then we don't have the perfection in question in your will. We don't have your will at all. In order for you to be united to God, there got to be two wills that converge in harmony around the perfect good. And if what we've got in you is just God's will, we don't have the two wills we need for union. So that method of getting perfect righteousness in you destroys the possibility of union. It doesn't provide it. That's the problem. Yes, Laura. Um, yeah, I want to say something on behalf of um, St. Thomas' theory of the atonement. Um, I don't think, I guess I don't think it goes, you know, your description of it goes quite deep enough. Um, you know, C.S. Lewis says there's only two types of people in the world, those who say to God, thy will be done, and those who say, my will be done. Um, and and um, I think Thomas sees that as the essence of sin, is preferring to make yourself happy or trying to make yourself happy rather than trusting God to give you happiness. So um, in the garden, for instance, that's the turning away of the will from God. So the, the atonement um, of Christ is one way of trying to restore that obedience of the will to God, that total trust in God, and another way of showing God's continued love for us in spite of the fact that we fail to trust in his love. So giving us, in a way, the supreme proof of his love and um, the way our sufferings enter into it seems to me very much integral to the whole story because it's union with Christ in his suffering. In other words, there's a mysterious way in which we do honestly unite our sufferings. We, being part of the body of Christ, as you put it there, is literally real. It's an ontological reality. So we can freely unite our sufferings with those of Christ and um, help, therefore, in the 
restoration, you might say, of all creation to him. Um, and in every other effect of all the other graces, you might say, of the atonement, we can make them our own and therefore grow in these other, in the love, which is our purpose in life, right? Union with God, giving of ourselves completely to God, trust in him and so forth. So I think, you know, it's, it's very important to, to retain that kind of mysterious dimension. I mean, it's a mystery of the faith and it's likely to remain a little mysterious, but, um, you know, it's, it's focused on the phrase that as in Adam all die, so in Christ shall all be made alive or all who wish it, right? So I think, I mean, I do think that helps bring at least the atonement and the problem of evil or problem of suffering together. Well, you know, I don't dissent from anything you said, and I appreciate your saying it. I think you said it in a beautiful and a moving kind of a way. But the issue is to understand it. So the first thing to remember here is that from Aquinas' point of view, the old Augustinian line is totally true. There is no good in a human will which is not put there first by God. So if you voluntarily unite your sufferings with those of Christ, it's because your will has already been healed to some extent by, by, by God's grace. And then the question is, how does God's grace do that while preserving your will? And the much more important question is, what has anything about that process got to do with Christ's passion and death, as Aquinas believes it does? And what you say on that score is, well, it's a mystery. That, that um, is certainly where I left it, but I left it there because I don't understand it, not yet. But Aquinas doesn't think it's a mystery. Aquinas is very clear on what mysteries there are in the Christian faith, and that's not one of them. He feels he can't explain it. So it may be, it may, may very well be, that I have not sufficiently absorbed what I need to learn from him, or from Calvin, or from Luther, or from, uh, you know, Rahner, for that matter.